Hi everyone and welcome to the Splunk Flash Fiction Showcase for International Flash Fiction Day 2020. My name is Neil O'Connor and I'm editor at Splunk and we have nine readers for you tonight in this showcase. Um, we're an Irish-based flash fiction online journal and you can find us at splunk.ie. Mm -hmm. We publish flash fiction and microfiction in English and in Irish. Um, and our nine readers tonight are made up of our editorial team and special guest readers from each of our first three issues. So on we go. Our first reader tonight is Neil Clark from Edinburgh in Scotland. Neil is Best of the Net and Best Small Fictions nominated. His first print collection, Time Wow, comes out later this year with Back Patio Press in the USA. And you can find him on Twitter at Neil or Clark or visit neilclarkwrites.wordpress.com. Neil features in our brand new issue of Splunk, issue three, with a micro. Uh, so welcome, Neil. We're delighted to have you, and you can take it away. Thank you very much, Nola. Great introduction, and thanks for um, having me be part of this. Um, so I'm going to read two very short stories, um, starting with Universe in a Box, which is in issue three of Splunk. So I'll just get started. Universe in a box. My children found my old universe in a box. When I was their age, they were all the rage. You'd reach inside and stars would coat your fingers like glitter. You'd rinse your hands and galaxies would be washed down the sink. At night, I'd find stellar remnants on my pillows. The screams of displaced civilizations pierced my dreams like cosmic rays. I told my children not to touch. It's precious, I said. After they went to bed, I dipped my pinky in, held it to my ear, allowed the crackle of destruction to make me feel young. So that was Universe in a Box. Um, and my second micro is an even shorter one. Um, it was actually so short that it was a tweet story that I did early last year, um, which was well received. And it's also going to be part of my forthcoming book, uh, Time Well, as you mentioned, Noah, uh, which is out later this year. So I'll just start with that one. Tonight, I fall from the sky. My blood absorbs into me. My bones heal. The airbag sucks into the steering wheel. The car uncrumples and veers onto the road. I drive home backwards. I unkiss you goodbye and go into the house where I haunt you until the day we meet. Brilliant. Thanks a million, Neil. Uh, Fantastic reading. Um, we'll press on. Our next reader is Sharon Telfer, who lives near York in the UK. Sharon has published twice with Splunk in issues one and three, and her stories have won prizes, including the Bath Flash Fiction Award twice and the Reflex Fiction Award also. Uh, in 2018, she was awarded the New Writing North Word Factory Short Story Apprenticeship. She's an editor at Flashback Fiction, which is a journal of historical flash. She tweets at, at Sharon Telfer. Welcome, Sharon. Looking forward to hearing you read. Thank you, Lula. Thanks for having me. Um, the story I'm going to read is an historical flash. It's one of the stories I wrote in the year after my father died. And I noticed I was passing through phases of grief and grieving, and that made me think about um, formal mourning rituals. Uh, so this story is called A Household Guide to Mourning Etiquette for Widows. Funeral. Hill's fingers tap her spine like a ghost at the window. She shivers. No one touches her now but the maid and the baby tucking at her breast. No hand traces the swell of her belly, the curve of her hip. Hill tightens the laces. Her ribs curl, her heart displaces, her breath shallows. It feels like an embrace. If there is nothing to hold her in, she will fall apart. The dress blots the floor, a black pool. She steps in, raises her arms like a drowning woman dragged down by weeds as Hill lifts the stiff bombazine about her. At the front door, she drops the veil. The world darkens. 
as if it is she who is lowered into the grave. Full mourning to be worn for one year. She may neither visit nor receive visitors. She circles the garden while Hill walks out with the baby. Her sheenless skirts deaden the winter light. Seed heads hang in the frost. When she tries the side door to the orchard, she finds it locked. Each night, she staggers as Hill unhooks the whalebone stays. On honeymoon, unlacing her, he had whispered how the great whales sang in the southern seas. Such swooning, such swooping, could only be the call of love across the deep. The cold side of the bed, his hand falls to the ache between her thighs, but she hears only the whistle of her own thin blood. Second morning, to be worn for nine months. Hill unpicks the crepe ribbons from her dress. The baby, crawling now, sucks a strand of softness like kelp. Certain jewellery becomes permissible. She pins jet to her throat. As she enters church, black bead eyes speculate her worth, calculate how long before she becomes available. She takes down the drapes covering the mirrors, yearning to find him trapped within the dimpled glass. Her face, alone, stares back, unfamiliar. Empty rooms unfold behind her. Half morning, to be warm for three months. She sits by the fire in her ash-grey dress, reading to her shadow husband in his vacant chair. She can no longer summon the pitch of his voice. In the hallway, Hill shushes the child's staggering giggle. Out of morning. The boy, no longer a baby, runs ahead and waits by the orchard door. The breeze ruffles his dandelion hair. His face is opening like a rose, his father's eyes that tilt of his chin. Hill hands her the heavy key. It snubs in the lock. She works it into place gives a firm twist, presses her hand to the creaking wood. The boy, copying, leans and adds his newfound weight to hers. The door gives. She gathers her forget-me-not skirts and takes his sticky hand. Together, they step through the opening, into the blossoming snow-white spring. Thank you. Beautiful, thank you. Um... Our next reader is Lisa Nikon Brehav, and Lisa is our Agarhor Grenga, or our Irish language editor, and she also does a lot of our PR stuff. She writes English and Irish language flash on various themes, with a particular focus on women's stories. She recently had a piece of Splunk fiction, that's Splash Australia, published in Core magazine, and two English pieces in Anthologies mm -hmm. in the USA. Fall to Lisa, looking forward to hearing what you have to read. Grimila Wagat Nula, um so Shush, Gail Splank, a screen made the core Nimi Sasha, Queen Am Ashtok and Environment. Um I'm gonna read rather than read two pieces, I'm gonna just read a piece in English and Irish that I wrote. Um I, I don't like to think of them as translations, but two different versions of the same story. Um uh Mila Buikas Asan Jesh. So Sha Quarantine. No Rahni and Mermalova and Alehim de Shah being she their crew. Ni mala man trev shi shah, me karibli and dish riv makugu brela, lehim than virish. Be an agla arm, ni smo, ne lehim to shah, Somalia, un skola viam, an lar fad, gach la, le mami, agus la daddy. Be an chene svargi ne lehim to shah, scradden she er wami, agus er nimra er an nuacht, fiu nur nach fejer loe a klishta, bulan she an bala, lena dern moor, agus honi smo spiltenis of alla. Ohanig on virus. Degan ob when I'm saltos and tra idra do agus a shea clog, and trevshishin tereshna scola la mami, sullavil and chesh and on ober, be a mcbranuer and glog, sulla fill and shea walla, agus mohliam and talus erma aden. Tan tan seer shin imaha unanish, kailta, neil and cunis shin agan, lesh and dowel virus show. Bawalam dolarash er skull. Bualam Gavilak Daddy or Nubber, Agus Gamek Dara, Ladora Mami. Curran on quarantine Farragher, Bianchini Sfaragi Lin, Nelehin Dishaw, 
nor a neam negreha, nor a curm adi a machar and lena, nor us gleam on durus, nor a gunam on durus, nor a heam chias, nor a yasam suus. Cut our shoelag at the inchig. Tani small relicha egg at dunanish. Nilain sussagrin, nilain to show why. Weren't August may a machulus and he had bring no diagon fui, foon galer, in a nerty and shame wood. August being chichin agam nis miniki, nilain to show. Nurgushim, fecum bal fru ur ermachrakan gach majin, uni herivre. Tasulagum gaduken its law on us show. Tashi in a lee er an orlor, a cullen, a carp, four a nish, agus brain to fulla er a hayden, er a cleaverach, sucker, imihe. Rihan on buco og on tach, scarha on a water than hedor, o dos chase of rin, rihenche. Agus asperla. Um, quarantine. When I look at my hands these days, they shake. I don't like it this time. I'm four now, nearly five, with the virus and everything. I get afraid more these days. I'm not as brave as I used to be. I should be stronger now, though. I'm nearly, I'm a, I'm a big boy, Mom said. I'm homesick every sco- day from school now, all day, every day, and I'm not even sick. Mom said it's not because I'm sick, it's because the school is closed because of the virus. So I'm home with mom and with dad. And he gets angrier these days. He shouts at mom and the, the people on the telly, even though they can't hear him. That's silly, I whisper, but I'm careful to be quiet in case he hears. He punches the wall a lot these days, and there are more holes since the virus came. My favorite time of the day before the virus was two till six o'clock after school with man before he came home from work. And I'd always get sad when he came home. My hands would get a bit more sweaty. That time's gone now though, that nice quiet time with man. And we've no quiet now because of this stupid virus. I want to go back to school and I want man to stop crying. The lockdown infuriates him. He's always angry with us, but more so now. When I wash the dishes, when I put the clothes out in the line, when I open the door, when I close the door. What are you doing now, you stupid woman? He has more rules for us these days. Usually we get a break, but not anymore. Not these days. Sometimes when I sleep at night, I dream about him, about our family and about him hurting us. I have those dreams more often now. These days, these, these awful days. And when I wake in the morning, new bruises on my skin from the night before. I hope he goes back to work soon and we get some peace. I hope we survive this. She lies on the floor, her body still warm just slightly, much of her skin colder and colder though, and her chest. Bruises scattered across her whole body, calm. He lays his small hand on her cheek, Mammy's cheek, tears and blood dried on it now, and backs away from her slowly and runs away for the first time leaving her since he'd grown inside her. Gone from her and from his father for good, he runs. Oh, girl, lead him out at least. Oh, my God. That was a heartbreaker. Um, thanks a million. So our next reader is another Splunk editor. This is Robert Barrett, who lives in County Wicklow in Ireland. Robert writes flash fiction, short stories and plays. And his flash have appeared in the Fish Anthology, The Incubator and Bath Flash Fiction Volume 4, amongst other places. In 2017, he won the prestigious PJ O'Connor Award for Radio Drama. Great to see you, Robert. Looking forward to hearing you. Thanks, Nola. Um, well, I've got two little stories for, for you today. Um, and the first one is one of those stories from the Fish Anthology in uh, 2016. And uh, it's a story I like because the boy in the story, and it's uh, a devastating day in his life, but I knew this person as, a, as an adult. Uh, they're no longer with us now, but um, this story is kind of taken from what they told me. And the last line is a line uh, that he heard as a child. So it's called A Mother's Love. New clothes were thrown from a brown paper bag. Put them on, she said. The other boys watched him warily as he stepped out of his pajamas and pulled on the strange garments. The nun took his shoes and spat across the toes of each before scrubbing them with an old rag. When he was dressed, she took him by the arm and marched him down the corridor to the front hall. Stumbling to keep pace, he daren't look up 
as his mind ran with the imaginary crimes he might have committed. She nudged him towards a chair. Wait here, she said. Your mother is coming for you. He lifted his head to the nun as the meaning of the words broke over him and his breath began to quicken. Her eyes betrayed nothing. And in a moment she was gone, her footfall echoing away on the cold marble tiles. As he fought back the heat of new tears, he thought that surely she wouldn't joke about such a thing as that. Her own mother had offered to drive and she stopped the car at a tea house in Maynooth to break the journey. There, over empty cups and saucers, she begged her daughter to leave the child where he was. What life can you give that boy when the world knows he has no father and no name and no hope? In the name of God, leave him in good care and don't lay shame upon shame upon shame. The light was dimming in the front hall when he heard urgent footsteps approach. Are you still here? She said. My mother is coming for me, he said, standing to face her. The nun laughed. There's no one coming for you, she said. So, sorry, two, two sad stories about children there. Um, so the second one um, is a new story which I've been just working on in the last few days. And uh, it's kind of about man's inhumanity to, inhumanity to man and the fact that we, we, we kind of only see our own injustices. So this one is called they came back for their bones. First came the rumble underfoot, the curly leaves of the mesquite grass dancing, the tinny jingle of their boot spurs, and in the east, a dust cloud rose to shadow the sky. Callahan raised his field glasses. When they came, they came fast, an exalted thunder of flesh and bone, a blackish sea five miles wide, a murmuration of God's own that, even at a gallop, took a solid hour to pass. The men took up camp and apprenticed their trade the hard way, first splitting the herd and chasing them down on horseback. That left the carcasses too strung out when the hide pullers came. In time, they learned to come up from downwind and take out the lead bull. Lost of a leader, the herd stood senseless, dazed, while the hunters shot using two rifles each turn about to rest the overheating barrels. After a day's work, there was nothing in the air but the throat torn balls of young calves, not worth the price of lead, confused and starved from pucking at dead udders. When the men moved off, the bloating carcasses lined the plains, the stench following them west on the breeze in search of more herd. When the buffalo dwindled, they poisoned the carcasses to kill the wolves that came to scavenge and then they skinned the dead wolves. The Indians moved to the reservations, hungry now, the women and children walking at night and sheltering during the day from the blazing heat. When the buffalo were gone, they came back for their bones, gathering the sun-bleached relics to be ground down and shipped east for fertilizer. Five dollars to the ton, good money for free bounty. Callahan joined a gang of Sligo men, working the bone wagons to the railhead, Buffalo skulls piled high as Truskmore and Knocknashee. At night they drank rye and told tales of hundred dollar paychecks and Chickasaw whores. Loud talking, no listening men, the runnels and rivulets of their ears blown clean from the crack of 50 caliber rifles. When the drink died in him, Callahan recalled the great hunger of his youth, 4,000 miles away. Children digging roots from ditches, their gums bled white from scurvy, their breath grown shallow and quick, too weak to beg. And he cursed into the fire of an Oklahoma night, the heathen bastards who ruined his native land. Beautiful, Robert. Thanks a million. Some Thanks. gorgeous images in there. Um, our next reader is Blanc's visual editor, Janice Liagra. She's an American writer and mixed media artist, and her writing has appeared in Spelk, Ellipsis Scene, Bending Genres, and just loads more places. She was shortlisted for the 2017 Bridport Prize for Flash Fiction, and is a 2018 Best of the Net nominee. And you can find her on Twitter at Janice Liagra. Janice, welcome. Thank you. Um, the first story I'm going to read is actually the 
first story that I ever had published with Spelk Magazine in February of 2018, and it's called Milestones. Maybe you knew it when I was three and still wearing diapers, and you were convinced that I was either doing it out of spite or because I loved walking around in my own piss. Or maybe you knew it when I was in second grade and Kathy Davenport wrote a letter in beautiful cursive to the president and he wrote back to her, but I got an F in penmanship. Then again, maybe it was when I was 13 and still didn't need a bra, even though Megan Higby not only wore one, but also started her period when she was nine. Maybe it was when Megan invited me to her 14th birthday party because you and her mom were in the garden club together and I forgot her gift in the car and you hoped I was happy that you'd have to make excuses for me to Mrs. Higby. Or perhaps it was when I started applying to colleges and decided to major in psychology and you hoped I didn't think I'd actually be able to do anything with that degree. Or maybe it was during spring break of my sophomore year when I noticed a lump in my breast and I didn't mention it to you until I got the results back from the doctor. And you told me I should have gone to the same doctor that Elaine Murphy went to because who knew what kind of quack I'd picked out for myself. It could have been when I had to drop out of school for the rest of the semester to start treatment and you'd just known something like that would happen. Or it might have been when the doctor told us that the treatment hadn't worked and I eventually had to go to hospice. And you had to cancel that last trip to the coast and the hotel wouldn't refund the money. Or perhaps it was when the nurse called you while you were in the middle of dinner at that new French restaurant that took weeks to get into to tell you that the time was near. Or maybe it was when you were at my bedside holding my hand and you thought that that would be as good a time as any to tell me that you loved me but I didn't hear you because I was already gone. I think it may have been then when you finally knew for sure that I would always disappoint you. And my second story is called Mother Earth is a Necrophiliac. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, and that was published in Bending Genres in June of last year. Mother Earth truly doesn't care if you live or die, but she prefers you dead. She lets you think you're in control, but you can tell when she's getting randy. The air is laced with the smell of rain. The wind blows through her trees, making the leaves whisper and tremble. She strikes up a choir of bees to set the tone, get herself in the mood. Her clouds open, she thunders, she's electric. Her ground is wet, soaking. She shudders and shakes, splits open. Her oceans form a tsunami, spilling everywhere, engulfing everything in their path. An orgy of bodies, screaming, howling, swallowed up. The sun reappears in the liquid sky. The loamy earth gushes and pulses with the murmur of frogs. She's warm and glowing spent. Then she's back for more. Some manner of this happens every day, multiple times a day. Somewhere she's desecrating a body and getting off on it. Sometimes she is so cold, an ice queen, solid. You might think you can break her. You drill down, fish around, take what you can bait and yank up. In her harvest season, you may strip her of her fertile raiment, leave her naked and barren. Other times you might set fire to her, make her a burning wilderness, no matter. This isn't her first rodeo, she can take it. Eventually she will have you and she will have you dead. This unquenchable desire of hers, you act like it's a big deal, say she needs help, but what could be more natural than recycling human bodies? devouring them, body and soul, regurgitating them, swallowing them down again. She won't stop. She can't. Not until she's had her way with every last one of you. Great stuff, Janice. Lovely to hear you read. Great to see you too. 
Our next reader is a, a guest reader. Matt Neil Hill is from the UK, and Matt featured in issues one and two of Splunk. Matt worked as a psych nurse for many years and says what he is now is anybody's guess. He's married and has cats, and his writing features or is forthcoming in Vesterian, Weird Book, Syntax and Salt, and Shotgun Honey. And you can find him on Twitter at Matt Neil Hill. Welcome, Matt. Looking forward to hearing you read. Thank you, Nuala. Um, I've got two micro uh, stories this evening, um, both from Splunk. Uh, the first one is Phantom, which is the first um, micro I ever wrote. I pull the belt tight around my forearm with my teeth. The women laugh on the street below, following my scarlet trail, calling for me like a lost puppy. The stump of my wrist throbs like a broken heart. I had no idea she'd have a girlfriend tailing her, much less one with a hatchet. I'd thought that I could just get on with it. They spot me on the fire escape and howl like banshees. I panic, slip, reach out to grab hold with the hand that's just a phantom. Gravity teaches me my second lesson of the evening. And my second story is um, called Awake Adrift uh, from issue two of Splunk. Um, and as I quite often do, this was, I just thought of the saddest thing I could think of. And that was the inspiration for the story. So, Awake Adrift. I'd been pretending these last few days that you'd run away to your sisters again. And when I saw you drifting through our home, it was my insomnia projecting daydreams on thin air, your finger in the dust that had settled on the sideboard, enjoying its hiatus from persecution. But now, in the crowd of blurred faces, another glass pressed into my hand, seasick slop of whiskey across my knuckles, your shadowed form passing through the wall with barely a backward glance, Satisfied somehow, it sinks in, finally. The priest's words long ago about death and how it would part us. Great stuff, Matt. It's wonderful to hear that that was a firm favourite with the editorial team and still is. Thanks so much. Great to hear Thank you. you. Um, our next reader is another guest reader. Um, She's representing issue two of Splunk here. Railton Nilanon is an, uh, um, was Dublin City University's Irish language writer in residence in 2019. And her fourth book, the short story collection Inni, will be published later this year. Information on Railton's other books and her online publications can be found via her blog, Thoris Sawan, uh, which is at thorisalsha.blogspot.com. Okay, so um, I'll read the version that Splunk published, which is the Irish version, and then the English version after that. So, Shachni and Sool. Honey, Mama Yara for Tranona, Shilam. The Shishul a Masna Scafji team meeting Victor Lam or Wahor Alakia. And this should be on. The MPs on Sobinyak, Kincha, and Kreta. August a foot kata. Da, Kabis. Bela Ashtriha Havisa da Gruiga Eki Liu and Al. Dahi a chi eshin, Obi, Gimme. Neil Doyer be a Mawasukam Tian da and Nishai and Fulk Kirna Eki. Blinda in ye in ye. Hugh she, Marie Hugh logician. The brew with a brustu treached the fluid to Saturn, a gannis. He am a kincher and he hae in the young. Dan that piece of teeth here, dear Hassan. The Vacamashkela, well, can he the Dano? Banu, Vahela, Chul. Har a hena, bar gun ruddy a yan on these massa than limbo shaw, a keen the plain to shear. He may a gaffe bug, 
a garnial cuan agus chia. Karma mavera heart er wogga te wajer agus iced coconut finger the him. Via solash, via om oiga. Neil Mackinche got a year old Karhamach, a Saudi V, and Seal Nua a V Krohi Ogam Buhan, and a Karjanua, and Jab Mai, and Chahin Skurha, Nepa, Fishadlik Fanta Jim, Jirach Maralasko and Kraken Jim, and Lashin, and Kraken Dinskiahan Clay, a Lusk. Gamrich, Egmahil, Nu. Nero Fonner and Belshir Boring Shin, the Mikyon, Na, in the Rain. Jilmeyer Mahachba Grish, Lamhain. And Daris Dritcher, Agassi Goss. Tashi Dritcher Mahas Mahail Rish, but not. Rinchama Ella, Agassi Kurta, a Wallach Rish, a Masna Bridgina. Hanum Harp Aram Hill, Jibraha, and Lahore, Omahail, Amanum, Amal, Aharish. And the English version. My sister on the street. I think I saw my sister on the street in the crowds outside the cinema on the Dublin Road. I think it was her. Whoever she was, she had her nose and her curly hair. Colour? Who knows? That was a movable feast from month to month, never mind the years since I last saw her. She walked like her, all hustle and bustle and in charge. Appearances can be deceiving. But I'm not sure. It's so long since I've seen her. I held back not wanting to be seen. For then, we would have had to decide. Do we greet each other? Walk past each other? That would have made things even worse. Worse than this mutually agreed limbo that we shared for the past 20 years. I sat down in a cafe off Corn Market after I saw her. I thought I did. Nursed a strong tea and a nice coconut finger. Comfort food. Food from my Belfast childhood. I don't know why it upset me exactly, but it did. It was as if all the hurt, carefully covered over and hidden beneath layers of new friends and new job, had all been stripped away with one flick of a vegetable knife. I didn't want to go back there. Not in my head. Not in my heart. Now I'm back home. She's closed out again. Almost. Bit of time and I'll have her buried under the layers totally. I'd be able to breathe easy. Jeanette. For me to mark a thread on Gorgeously read. Thanks a million. Our next reader is Splunk editor Adam Trod, whose writing has appeared in publications such as Banshee, Ellipsis and the National Flash Fiction Day Anthology and is forthcoming in the Fairlight Book of Short Stories. He's been shortlisted for the Courage Prize and the Bath Flash Fiction Award and has won both the Benedict Kiley Short Story Competition and the Book of Kells Creative Writing Competition. He's on Twitter at a underscore trod. So welcome Adam, looking forward to hearing you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Um, the first story I'm going to read is called Ophelia and it was in issue three of Banshee um, back in 2016. So I'll get going. Um, Ophelia. Rivers are often described like snakes. How they move the look and feel of them, sinuous, metallic, flowing. A silken muscular band that probes and exploits weakness, that moves incrementally, incessantly, 
towards prey. Like snakes, rivers too can swallow. I am now a liffy spirit, I suppose, weed in my hair, my skin pale, except where the plastic ties at my wrists and ankles have brought forth blood in red bangles. My eyes are open, sea blue like a stickleback's. The water presses on their turgidity with the intimacy of a lover. With the advent of time and the decay it brings, the pressure will seek equalization and my skull will become home to slickly sliding eels and lead gray mullet will kiss me with their puce leather lips. Where is my shroud? My troop of mourners, their face contorted in grief. Horses with plumes of feathers erupting from their foreheads like shining black fire will not bear me to my grave. Those who love me will not scatter soil in scant handfuls on the varnished veneer of my coffin. I have been eaten by a snake and I will be digested in its liquid belly until the rest of me is washed to sea in emetic remnants. There are rumours, of course. My life is being pieced together for the benefit of the public in media jigsaw pieces. Never mind that they saw the edges off the bits that won't fit and hammer them into place with grubby fists. The wrong crowd, couch to couch, estranged from her father, though not enough in my opinion. Mother dead, yes, as a teen. A pulverizing wrench to the soul from which there is no coming back. Walked alone through wasteland between estates, attempted to take her own, her own. Funny how it's described as my own now, that they've become its curator. Suspects interviewed, former boyfriend assisting with inquiries, appealing for information. They do that, hiding in plain sight. It's been done before. A boy throws a stone at my bloated belly. It rebounds, making the noise a space hopper makes and plops into the river. We are two parts of an equation nearing solution. He squints in the sun, poised for another throw, then drops his missile and hairs towards home. Later, the guardie will tell him that he found a mermaid. I am happy to have entered his life as a myth. And the second piece I'm going to read um, is from the Cormorant, uh, from issue three, three of the Cormorant, which was, is published by, it's edited by Louise Kennedy and Owen McNamee and Una Manuel. Um, and it's called The Last Inhabited Building in Your Shore. And just by way of context, um, Your Shore was a northern outpost of Vorgashur, which was a mining town in Russia. And by 2018, it had been abandoned and most of the inhabitants there had moved to a city called Vorkota, which is the fourth, large, fourth largest city uh, north of the Arctic Circle and reputedly the coldest city in, on the continent of Europe. Um, so the last inhabited building in your shore. We are plants striving for the light that shines through a small hole cut in cardboard. That is why we grow crooked, Irina says. She stands before the balcony window of her apartment in a building that hulks on the land dissolving like a massive block of dirty snow. I'm momentarily confused by the word crooked. I realize when she sighs that she doesn't mean physically. It is so dark here that the people seek out brightness in others and for that reason they are emotional explorers, slipping sideways like crabs through the cracks in one another's souls to bask in the light of closeness. Irina says that the government will soon cut off the electricity and she will go to live with her cousin in Vorkuta, where they paint vivid murals on the apartment blocks to fight against the endless white of winter. Her cousin's father was an architect, incarcerated as a political prisoner in the Gulag decades ago, 
who stayed behind after he was freed to help develop the city and made it his home. I wonder if I have met many of the descendants of those prisoners, people who grew so much from nothing. I wonder too if Irina is asking me to escape with her out of the darkness that is coming and hold her hand before a crumbling wall of painted suns. Thanks. Lovely, gorgeous, evocative stuff there. And the cormorant is a lovely thing. It's a broadsheet, so it's folded. It's a really attractive, um, kind of slightly little known, I'm going to say. They probably kill me for saying that, but it's a beautiful thing, so I'll make sure to send your work into it. Our final reader is uh, another Splunk editor, Marie Gethins. Marie is a writer based in Ireland, and her flash is featured in National Flash Fiction Day anthologies. Uh, Flash, the journal out of Chester, uh, Jellyfish Review, Banshee, Litro, Spalk, Ellipsis Scene, and many other places. She's a Pushcart and Best Short Fictions nominee and is pursuing a PhD under Joseph O'Connor at the University of Limerick. Thanks a million, Marie, for rounding off our Splunk showcase. Looking forward to hearing you read. Thanks, Nua. First off, I'd like to thank Janice, um, our multi talented. Uh, illustrator, and you heard her read earlier for the great Zoom backgrounds to accompany my two pieces tonight, um, superlative, and I'm very grateful for them. The first piece I'm going to read uh, won the inaugural uh, flash fiction competition at the shortstory.co.uk, TSS Publishing. And uh, Rupert and his team have been always kind and very supportive ever since. So this is Blood Ties. I watched the Red River flow down my arm and look for boats. Lips tight, chest stilled, I wait for miniature clipper ships to unfurl their sails. How many winter nights did we sit side by side, a length of cord each? A sailing notebook from the library propped on our kitchen table. We worked the patterns, near enough to touch, but we never did. My tiny fingers often swifter, defter than your monster-sized hands. Steve Dorr, cat's paw, overhand, sailor, lark's head. The hitches, timber, black wall, ossel, clove. We made the double carrick bend together, joining our pieces of twine into a single clutch. You mounted your great-grandfather's carpentry tools in a shadow box, and fed me tales of his life on the sea. The albatross that led them out of the icebergs to safety. The other sailor that shot it with a crossbow. At school, I learned that ancient mariner belonged to Coleridge, not our family legacy. With teenage spite, I showed you the rhyme. Watch your eyes shift to another time and place. A summer of doldrums passed between us. I found an aged envelope taped to your bedroom drawer's underside. I plundered the bounty, swallowed questions, and adopted the silence you'd kept for more than a decade. Through our mute nights, you nodded alone while I filled in my lifeline gaps. A family home near a forest, newsprint about the missing child, the tiny bracelet, its heart charm engraved with a distant name. One dawn, I placed them beside your coffee mug, a treasure trail leading me away from you. The fisherman found you swaying in a boathouse by the docks, a thick black rope. Six loops to make a collar knot that cinched tight when you stepped off the stool, a technique you didn't share with me. DNA delivered my new history and a family full of embraces that I can't return. Trees cluster around their house, branches rasp against windows, no seagull chorus or psalter tang. With a steak knife in the locked bathroom, I cry at the first slice, wait for the gush, and hope somehow it will loop me to you, sending us both upstream. The next piece I'm going to read uh, was published in Banshee issue 9, which is their current issue because they've had a bit of a delay. Um, and I'd like to thank Emer Claire and Laura 
<clears throat> not only for their wonderful support, but also for Laura's uh, really precise and sage editorial skills. It's always a privilege to be published there. This is Aspen and Pine. Oh, and I should change my Zoom background. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> I won't change my Zoom background. I will continue. Aspen and Pine. Scytherism, the sound of wind through trees. You labeled the memory stick, left it on top of my keyboard, an audio file. I clicked and closed my eyes. Leaves rustled, aspen trunks swayed. A distant creek? No, just, want, just wind, then sun heat on my scalp, leaves feathering my face. Green white flickers against a cloudless sky pool the sweetness of new foliage in the air. At five or six, I used to stick out my tongue and try to taste it, remember? My small hand folded into your warm palm. You guided me away from maverick stones and fallen branches. Seasons shifted to drier leaves, gilded overhead, brown underfoot, two pairs of boots forging a leaf mold trail. We followed a steep rise into murmuring conifers the percussion of crisp needles and squirrel raided cones. You inhaled the pine sharp scent, encouraged deep breaths. Later, I sent postcards of Finnish saunas and Russian roofs made from aspen, strong, straight, dependable, planks mellowed to gray. Nails cannot split them, difficult to burn, not like your soft pine, easily bruised, full of knots, hissing from the fire. Last month, we returned to old trails, but your walker prefers an urban landscape. The note you left beside the memory stick has detailed bullets. Your navy suit and gold tie. Which psalms and songs? The plot purchased long ago. But at the tapered hexagon, a shaky sketch of your final centerpiece, my hand trembled as I read, aspen or pine. I trust your choice. Thank you. Beautiful stuff, Marie. Thank you so much. It just shows how much life and how much breadth of life you can get into that fiction. It's great stuff. And Banshee is another wonderful Irish literary journal that I would encourage everyone to submit to. They take flash essays, uh, short stories, and poetry. So it's a great magazine based in Cork. Um, thank you to everyone for joining our first long. Uh, showcase reading. Happy National Flash Fiction Day to everyone. Happy International Flash Fiction Day. And um, we look forward to reading your work and publishing your work in the future. Thank you so much. <laughs>